So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for San Francisco's Climate Action Engagement Kickoff Webinar. My name is Cindy Cumberford, and I am the Climate Program Manager at the San Francisco Department of Environment, and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, the objective of all of us coming together this evening is so you can get acquainted with our climate action planning process in San Francisco and to provide you with information on how you can get involved. If you're joining us via Zoom and like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. So our agenda for this evening entails opening remarks from our very own Mayor London Breed, then we will have a panel discussion with our key city leaders on climate change and the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. And in the last part of this webinar, I will provide some background information on the city's climate plan and how you can get involved. So let's get started. Um, Ms. Debbie Raphael, the director of the Department of Environment will introduce our distinguished guests. Thank you, Cindy, and welcome everyone tonight, and thank you for joining us on this Thursday evening. I'm Debbie Raffel, and I'm the director of the San Francisco Department of Environment. And before I introduce our special guests, I want to offer a couple sentences of um, context for what we're embarking on together as a city, because I want to remind you that this plan is really all about you. For our climate action work and this plan to be successful, we need people like you from all walks of the city to participate and help shape the plan. Because climate change and the experience of climate change is a deeply personal thing. Perhaps you live in the Bayview and you experience climate change by increased heat waves and asthma rates, or perhaps you live at the coast and your experience of climate change are king tides or sea level rise, or maybe you live in low-lying areas where your experience of climate change are those atmospheric rivers that come in and give us the super storms. Everyone has their own experience today of climate change, and we're gonna need your unique perspective to get this right. So we're going to be hearing from our own wonderful mayor in a couple, in a minute or two, and I just wanna say, how important her leadership has been. For San Francisco to realize its climate action goals, we're gonna to need to become an all electric city, but an all electric city where our electricity is clean and from renewable sources. And Mayor Breed has been such an early champion of clean electricity. She was a fighter for Clean Power SF and she continues to fight for San Francisco to have its own power system run on renewable resources. She also understands that we can't do this alone, that San Francisco is part of a global network of cities who need to inspire each other and help each other learn. And so Mayor Breed hosted cities from around the world at the Global Climate Action Summit, where she set our bold and ambitious goals to be a zero emission city by 2030 and then by 2050. So now under her leadership, we are gonna be taking this next step to figure out how we get there together. So in collaboration with you, with the residents, the businesses, and even the commuters into San Francisco, we need you and we welcome you tonight. So we all join me in welcoming Madam Mayor Free. Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, good evening, it's great to be here. And it's great to see so many people participate in this very important event. Uh, with all the challenges we faced over this past year, including a global pandemic, a racial uprising, and most recently, a violation of our democracy at our nation's capital, a number of important issues facing us haven't been at the forefront of people's mind. But we know that global climate change is continuing, and we've, we're quickly running out of time to take the necessary steps to avoid the worst outcomes that are being projected. While San Francisco has always been at the forefront of the environmental movement, while President Trump was removing the United States from the Paris Accord, we were hosting the Global Climate Action Summit here in San Francisco and committing San Francisco to being a net zero emission city by 2050. And while I know that a new administration led by President Biden and Vice President Harris 
will make a massive difference in our national approach to combating climate change, that doesn't mean we can stop our local efforts. Yes, we need to continue to push Clean Power SF and work to meet our zero waste goals, but we can't stop there. We need to go further. In order to do that, we need to learn from our past mistakes. Take housing, for example. In September of 2019, the Board of Supervisors unanimously approved my legislation to transition private commercial buildings of 50,000 square feet and larger to 100% renewable electricity. And in 2019, I launched the Zero Emission Building Task Force, which along with Supervisor Raphael Mandelman's leadership, passed San Francisco's first most ambitious piece of climate legislation with the elimination of natural gas from new buildings. These are important steps, but we need to be clear that this is the easy part. The most important thing we can do is to actually build the housing that San Francisco has largely failed to do for too long. The most important thing we can do is recognize that density isn't a dirty word. We know that people who live in cities have a significantly lower carbon footprint than people who do not. Living in a city makes it easier to commute by public transit, to walk, or to take a bike. And multi-unit buildings are generally more energy efficient than a single family home. So we need to confront our history of blocking housing Be because by not building housing, we've pushed out a generation of low and middle income residents. These are the bus drivers, the janitors, the home care workers, the people I grew up with. When we don't build housing, they have to drive in from Stockton, from Fairfield, Antioch, choking our freeways with traffic and worse, our air with pollution. For decades, we pushed low and middle income residents into new development outside of the city. In recent years, we've seen the devastating destruction of homes that were pushed out into fire prone areas. And in the last year, we have seen that housing is directly related to public health as overcrowding has made it near impossible for some people to isolate from COVID-19. So let's be clear, you cannot call yourself an environmentalist if you consistently oppose housing in San Francisco. We have to move past this. The evidence is clear that building new housing makes housing more affordable, creates the jobs that we need for our economic recovery, moves people out of their cars and fights global climate change. It's time to end the debate on building more housing in our city and just focus on building. Now I'm excited about this community effort and I wanna really take this moment to focus on equity. It's been at the top of what I have cared about the most since becoming mayor. But I wanna be sure that as we are doing all of the outreach we are doing through this process that we are being inclusive. There are a lot of people who are committed to fighting climate change in this city and I love that. I love the passion, I love their voices, I love the excitement, hell, I love being educated on new ideals and new ways in which we can improve and make it better for future generations to come. I wanna leave this planet a better place than I found it. But we also need to recognize there are a lot of people who are trying to live their lives and just trying to get by that we need to listen to. They may not be the experts, but we are a diversity, both of neighborhoods and of people. We need to hear from the people on the West side who are concerned about the state of the great highway, just as we need to hear from the people on Embarcadero who are concerned about sea level, sea level rise. We need to hear from the people in the Bayview who are concerned about what's happening at the shipyard. We need to listen to the young worker who rides their bike to the office downtown, just as we need to listen to the senior who needs their car to get around because it's the only way they can. Equity means listening. It means understanding. This is what I want to see come out of this community process. All of us working together, not to figure out if we'll meet our climate goals, but how we'll reach our climate goals. Because we are out of time when it comes to this debate. Our climate goals go hand in hand 
with our upcoming economic recovery. Our climate goals go hand in hand with our achieving the type of equity we strive for as a city. Our climate goals go hand in hand with creating the type of resiliency that we need to face whenever challenges come our way next. San Francisco can continue to lead the way if we enter this process with the understanding that this can and must be done. I look forward to working with all of you to make this happen. And thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Wow. Thank you, Mayor London Breed. That was the 45th mayor of San Francisco and the first African-American woman and second woman in San Francisco's history to serve as mayor. As we heard from the mayor, addressing climate change needs to go beyond climate pollution. And we need to have a framework that broadens our horizons to solve climate change in an equitable way. I think we heard loud and clear that housing policy is climate policy. And our mission shouldn't just be about climate change, but climate justice. So I'm super excited to introduce our panel discussion. We have a multidisciplinary panel of city leaders to discuss the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead for San Francisco. So I'd like to welcome back Debbie Raphael, the Director of the Department of Environment, Tom McGuire, the Director of Sustainable Streets at the SFMTA, which is the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, Ted Egan, the Chief Economist at the Office of the Controller in San Francisco, and also Dr. Navina Baba, the Deputy Director of Health for SFDPH. Welcome, everybody. And if we can make sure we all unmute ourselves, that would be great. So I have questions for all of our panelists. And before you answer your first panel, I'll ask that you introduce yourself to the audience. At the end of our 30 minute panel discussion, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Listeners, you can include your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom screen, not the chat. You may not have time to answer all of your questions today, but I'll let you, let you know at the end of the webinar how you can contact us. So, for the audience, as the mayor said, San Francisco has set a net zero emission goal by 2050. And this is a big, bold, ambitious goal, right? Right now, there's no city in the world that is carbon neutral or a zero emission city. San Francisco's climate strategy is to focus on six big sectors to reduce emissions, buildings, housing, energy supply, land use, and transportation, production and consumption, and healthy ecosystems. And while San Francisco has been successful in, in passing aggressive climate legislation, there are often critical factors that cities don't control or that are extremely difficult. Debbie, let's start with you. If you can tell the listeners a little bit about your background and discuss some of those critical factors and what type of leadership is necessary to tackle these thorny issues. Thanks, Cindy. And wow, that was totally the most wonderful presentation by the mayor. And I am um, incredibly excited uh, to hear her level of engagement and excitement. And I hope everyone feels that same partnership energy that she put out today. So as I, you know, I am Debbie Raffel, Department of the Environment Director. Uh, what you may not know is that I was trained as a scientist. And there goes my phone. Wow. I was trained as a scientist and decided uh, not to pursue that career, but to, to use my science in public service. And that is something I have done now uh, in various cities at the state level back in San Francisco for a couple decades. And I, I couldn't be happier with where I get to serve now. When I think about the question of how are we gonna get to that bold goal, I'm reminded of something that was said really 20 years ago by Kofi Annan. He was the Secretary General of the United Nations at the time. And what he said, I'll paraphrase a little bit. He said, we have the means and the capacity to deal with the world's problems. But what we often lack is the political will. And I feel like that is where we are today. We know what we need to do. 
It's not a mystery. The what we need to do is pretty clear. It's the how we do it and how we do it with bringing everyone along and are we willing to do it? We know the what, it's do we have the political will? So political will comes from leadership. It also comes from the people like us, you in the audience who support those leaders, push those leaders, cheer those leaders on so that they can have the courage to take risks and make the decisions they need to. And it's not just up to the leaders. It's our will, our own political will, if you will, to make the changes that we need to do. Each of us can become what I call a conscious consumer, where we're being very aware of each of our decisions around how we move about the city, what we buy, what we throw away, what we do with it, what kind of energy we purchase. Those are all conscious consumption choices that we have that truly make a difference. And we need to show up and support our leaders too. That's gonna to be really important in the next few years as different pieces of legislation come before the Board of Supervisors. We need to show up and let them know we're behind them. As a society, I would end, we need to come to grips with the fact that there really is no place for fossil fuels. There's no place for fossil fuels in our homes, the way we heat our homes. There's no place for fossil fuels in our transportation system, whether it's our own car or our buses or the trucks that are delivering to us on a daily basis these days. There's no room for fossil fuels in industry, in the medical system, in manufacturing. We need to become an all electric society. So here in San Francisco, we know what political will can look like. We know what we need to do. And one of the places I'm most excited about starting out on is in that built environment, that building sector, that housing sector that the mayor talked about, as well as our commercial sector. That's what I think is needed in the next few years. Thanks, Debbie. So the mayor really stressed building housing and I wanna turn our conversation towards buildings. Uh, there has been some recent legislation on all electric buildings and new construction. Um, and in terms of strategies and policies that need to get passed, maybe you could talk a little bit about that ordinance and was that the low hanging fruit? And can you discuss as we move into the future, how hard will it be to get to net zero emissions for our existing commercial and residential buildings? So that legislation that you refer to, Cindy, is the, the ban on natural gas and new construction. So that means that all new buildings, whether they're residential or commercial, whether they're a multifamily unit, a single family home, a large skyscraper, a small two-story business, all of those will be beat, built to be all electric. We will not have natural gas lines coming into buildings um, and they will be operated by clean electricity that is supplied uh, by Clean Power SF or by PG&E. I actually like the metaphor, and rather than thinking of a low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. I, I like to think of it as the ripest fruit, that, that what we did in that ordinance is we actually chose the thing that is ready to go now, that ripe opportunity, if you will, um, because new construction is really ripe, it's ready to go. We know that constructing a new building that's all electric is cost effective. We know that it doesn't cost any more to do. In fact, it can be cheaper. We know that all electric buildings are healthier because you don't have the off gassing from burning natural gas in your stove or from leaks in the natural gas system, which we know are present. We know they're safer because if there's an earthquake, you don't have a gas line you need to worry about. We know that they're resilient. After an earthquake, it's gonna be a lot faster to, for us to turn on our electricity than it is to restore our natural gas system. And they're technically feasible. They are able to be built now. All electric new construction is truly ripe and ready to go. Doesn't mean it's easy. It does not mean that it's easy because we're gonna to have to train a new workforce or the workforce to be able to build those buildings. And we're gonna to need to find a way to transition our workforce in a just way so that we don't put people out of work in this new future. Because ultimately, it's not just the new buildings, it's the existing buildings. And part of the reason we have such an urgency on this is every building we build 
today that has natural gas in it digs the hole deeper, that climate hole ever so much deeper in the future when we wanna tackle existing buildings. Existing buildings, the ones that are already out there right now, and there are thousands of them, is gonna to be tough because we're gonna to need to find a way to, to replace gas boilers, recla replace gas stoves in a way that is cost equitable, that doesn't burden low-income families, that doesn't make it impossible to live in San Francisco. And there are, there's gonna be retraining needs too. We need to make sure that those good union jobs that are right now associated with natural gas, whether they be in power plants or in the plumbers and the pipe fitters that install natural gas, we can't leave those people behind. They deserve to be part of the new economy. And it's incumbent on all of us to think through the changes we make when we scale them up. So I would just end with, in order to achieve this goal that we have to transform our built environment, we're going to need leadership and brave leadership, not only at the local level, but at the state and federal level as well. So showing up really means that all of us communicate to the Board of Supervisors, to our legislature in Sacramento, and to the new administration in Washington that we need everyone to be going in the same direction with those same goals if we're gonna achieve what we need. Great, thanks Debbie for all that information. And you know, buildings are such an important part of our climate solutions. Um, in San Francisco, buildings are our second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm gonna start talking about transportation, which is our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in San Francisco. So in San Francisco, there is a big push to get residents to take 80% of their trips by sustainable modes by the year 2030. Um, this means by walking, biking, or public transit. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has hit San Francisco's public transportation system hard. Uh, the public transportation system crashed with about an 80% reduction in ridership. And I know it's rebounded a little bit, but we know passenger numbers are likely to be lower in the near to medium future. Um, within the transit world, uh, everyone is worried and some experts have termed this the death spiral, a cycle of less service and fewer riders. Tom, if you could introduce yourself to the listeners and discuss how San Francisco is managing this difficult transition period for a public transportation system. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Uh, and it is a very difficult time uh, in the public transportation industry. Uh, I'm Tom McGuire, I'm the Director of Sustainable Streets at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Uh, at the MTA, I'm responsible for uh, everything that happens in our streets, uh, traffic flow, traffic safety, parking, pedestrian and bicycle safety, as well as our construction program. Uh, and the way that we're dealing with this crisis uh, is, is multi-pronged approach. Uh, as you said, Cindy, we've seen a collapse in our ridership. San Francisco is a, is a city that is, was built around mass transit. It doesn't work without mass transit. Uh, and that was true uh, when, when Muni was formed back in 1912 and it's still true today. We get a large, the, the large majority uh, of our revenue comes from, from two sources, two, two users of the system. The transit riders who pay the fares and those who pay, uh, pay a parking garage, pay for parking uh, garages and meters. So as we've navigated shelter in place for almost a year now and fewer people are traveling, we have much less revenue with which to run the system. At the same time, our demand is down. So uh, we are recovering now from that low point where we had, uh, we, we reduced our service by nearly 80%. We are adding more buses and trains to the system uh, every every month, and that's important during this crisis because uh, there are people who don't have the op the option to shelter in place. There are essential workers who need to get to work. There are people who need to get to medical appointments and and now testing and perhaps now even vaccination sites. Muni and public transportation uh, is a lifeline for, for for those folks, those those people who come from every cross section of San Francisco. Um, we need to make sure that when people need mass transit. They can ride, not just ride, but ride with an appropriate level of social distance. So we've been really careful about bringing back service in the neighborhoods where, um, in the neighborhoods where passengers uh, are uh, most likely to be 
uh, are coming back to, to transit faster. We've also been using uh, some tools that have, that have been in our toolbox for a long time, but we've rolled out much faster than we have in years past. For instance, we're uh, building emergency transit only lanes on streets like Mission Street downtown to make sure that those buses not only don't get crowded because we're running enough buses, but they move reliably so that they don't get backed up in traffic. Um, we still do see congestion at certain points of the city, and we're going to see that growing as people begin to return to work uh, and begin to get out and about uh, uh, to, in, in their daily lives. The last piece of it that, that has been uh, really important for us to navigate has been uh, making sure that the federal, state, and regional partners who do provide a large, uh, the, the second biggest chunk of our funding, understand how important keeping Muni and all of the transit agencies in the Bay Area running is to keeping the city functioning. Uh, we, we were really uh, grateful that the CARES Act that passed early, uh, in 2020, uh, with a lot of leadership from Speaker Pelosi, did include a significant amount of money just to keep transit running, but it was really just enough to keep us running through calendar year 2020. Uh, and we're continuing to work with our legislators and our, our industry partners in, in Washington to make sure that um, the federal government, uh, which is certainly uh, the new administration, is much more transit friendly uh, from what we what we understand. We really need to make sure that they understand how central mass transit is to the recovery. Thanks, Tom. Yes, um, certainly uh, the Biden administration, Amtrak Joe, seems like uh, they will be a much more friendly transit uh, partner as we try to continually improve our, our transit in San Francisco. I know that San Francisco prides itself on being a, a transit first city. And for the listeners, uh, that is a policy that San Francisco has had for a long time that really prioritizes the movement of people and goods with a focus on transit and walking and biking instead of private automobiles. And we know that getting people out of cars is just an immense challenge. Um, which San Francisco really has met with some success, uh, having about over 50% of its trips by sustainable modes. But in terms of addressing this temporary downturn in transit ridership and solving the climate crisis, Tom, what role, what is the role of electric vehicles and what opportunities exist to promote other forms of sustainable transportation? Uh, thanks, that, that, that's, that's a really interesting question because I think there is uh, there, there's a lot of, there are people whose who's thoughts about sustainable transportation tend to go in the direction of, well, if we simply electrified every car in California or in the U.S., we would solve our, you know, solve the, the, the negative impacts of the transportation system. Um, that's, that's not quite right because, as I said, this is a city built around mass transit and walking and, uh, and biking. Uh, if San Franciscans drove at the rate that everyone else in California drove, we'd the city would be gridlocked 24/7, but we don't. Uh, we so 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 our approach to making the system more sustainable and driving down that that number it's still an embarrassing number. 40% of the emissions in the city coming from our sector. Uh, it, it's a two-pronged approach. The first is to ensure that as many sustainable options are available for as many people making as many trips as possible. We want to give everybody a great choice to get around without having to use their car. And then there will of course there will inevitably be trips that. Uh, can't shift to mass transit, can't be handled by walking or biking. And of course, well, there, there will always be car trips in the city. And we want to make sure that everyone who is using their car uh, or uh, another uh, another private vehicle has an opportunity to get access to electric, electric vehicles. Uh, one way we're navigating, uh, one way we're applying these principles to the emergence from the pandemic is, um, you know, we, we know that there are that, that as people begin to return to their more normal travel patterns, we may not have enough seats on Muni on day one for everyone to be able to travel after mass vaccination begins. And we know that we we will also not be able to accommodate them if they all choose to drive. We've we've started to pioneer uh, new programs like our slow streets program, trying to build a, a citywide network of low and no traffic streets from the uh, all the way from the Great Highway to to downtown, where people can. Uh, uh, people can walk, they can bike, uh, they can feel safe, uh, no matter what their age or ability is on the streets. So many of the trips in San Francisco are fairly short, and the majority of trips in San Francisco are less than a mile. They are a distance that can be walked and can be biked if only the streets were safe enough for people to, to have that as an option. Unfortunately, many people don't feel that's an option because of the, uh, the level of danger we have on our streets. We still have uh, uh, losing between 20 and 30 people in traffic crashes every year. Um, 
So when once we've done all that work, we still know that, there, that, that there's a key role for, for electrification um, further downstream from all that. So uh, what are some what are some of the kinds of trips that, that, that can't use a slow street or can't use Muni? Well, certainly delivery. I think that uh, Debbie mentioned uh, the, the the increase in freight traffic on our streets. We know there's there there are more delivery vans, more small cargo vehicles all over the city. Those are right for electrification strategy because they're not going away. Uh, we we uh, the, the, those are trips that you know, with the exception of some potential uh, transition to cargo bikes, we're going to see delivery trucks uh, for uh, for the for the foreseeable future. Uh, similarly, there are people who have trips that you know are going between origins and destinations that aren't well matched by public transit. We want to make sure that there are incentives in place, charging infrastructure in place, and available parking for people at both ends of their trips, so that uh, the people who are still making those trips do have an option to make it in a zero emission way. So uh, electrification of the vehicle fleet is a huge part of the sustainability strategy for San Francisco, and it's nested within that bigger most split strategy. Thank you, Tom. And I have to tell you, one of my uh, biggest sources of joy during the pandemic has been the Great Highway. So I hope that is something the city can make permanent. Um, I'd like to segue over to talking about the economy. Um, you know, the success of our building in San Francisco and our public transportation system returning uh, back to normal is, is really uh, dependent on our economic future. And since 1990, San Francisco has decreased its greenhouse gas emissions by 35% while increasing its GDP by 172%. So we have been successfully growing our economy and reducing climate pollution. But in March, we know San Francisco's economy plunged after the first shelter in place um, went into order. And we still face many significant challenges, which could really inhibit our city's progress on climate change. Ted, I've had an opportunity to see a couple of your presentations on the economic recession and COVID-19. And before we get into the potential opportunities around economic recovery and climate solutions, uh, could you introduce yourself and provide the listeners uh, a summary of some of the key points and challenges uh, to San Francisco's economic recovery, you know, beyond the virus abatement and distribution of vaccine. Sure, thanks, Cindy. Um, I'm Ted Egan. I'm the chief economist in the controller's office, and I direct the Office of Economic Analysis. We do economic impact reports on all major new city legislation. We also do a variety of types of economic research for city departments on request and particularly this year, this past year, track the, the state of the local economy uh, on a daily basis. Um, you mentioned the, the shutdown in March having an economic impact. I mean, nationally, that one month of March 2020 um, wiped out 10 years of economic growth. That's how many people lost their jobs in one month. In the Bay Area, it wasn't as bad. We only lost six years of economic growth, but that is a major change. Now, from, from April until November, we had job growth and we've gotten back about 40% of those jobs that were lost in March. But now December with the shutdown again, we're seeing job losses again nationally, we'll likely see job losses locally. And really the virus and the, the path of the virus is going to determine our economy uh, in the near term. There are a couple of things about San Francisco's recession that are very different. People talk about a, a K-shaped recession or a K-shaped recovery in which the wealthy are doing well, the upper part of the K is going up and low, low income people and low wage workers are doing bad. It is true that that's where the majority of, of the jobs are being lost nationally, whereas people in, in high paying office jobs are generally working at home, they're generally not being laid off and they have, they have less burden. In San Francisco, we're, we're having an extreme version of that. Um, a lot of our high wage workers are not just working at home, but they're moving. Uh, maybe 70,000 people have moved out of San Francisco in the past year. Uh, across California, the clearest correlation between how much has, has asking rents gone down is how many tech workers live in your city. So San Francisco had, and all along the peninsula and in, in, in Santa Clara, they're seeing big rent declines as tech workers um, move away, perhaps temporarily. Uh, what that means is, 
when when people are moving away, when tourists are not coming, when commuters are not coming to downtown from other parts of the Bay Area, that uh, that spending drives a lot of the rest of the city's economy in retail, in restaurants, in hotels, and low wage workers. And so, the the uh, a big piece of the city's uh, 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 economic life has has basically been on pause, and that's created a lot of hardship for low wage workers. So San Francisco has a a hurdle to get through that other places don't have, of getting people to move back to the city. Our tourism has been hit unusually hard compared to other places that has to come back. Our small businesses are down more than they are in other parts of California, and they have to reopen and come back as well before things start feeling economically normal again in our city. Wow, uh, that's a lot. I know the economic recession has happened faster and hit more deeply than I, uh, most people thought or that we could have imagined. And we know the shutdowns come with some temporary environmental benefits, but we know a crashing economy isn't really a climate solution. Uh, Ted, can you talk about how the coronavirus recession um, could reshape the economy and what are the prospects for addressing climate change in a post pandemic world? Um, sure. I mean, I agree with your first point entirely. It may it may feel like life is more relaxed and, and emissions associated with economic activity are going down, uh, but it's likely that that's going to reverse when the virus is abated and, and, and economic activity picks up again. I think the structural change that's happened in the past year is actually bad for the climate, and that's people moving out of cities, where San Francisco is an extreme example of that. Uh, but it's happening across the country, across the urbanized world. Uh, and as Mayor Breed indicated, the uh, environmental footprint of people who live in cities is so much less for a given level of development. And so one of the first things that will be good for the climate and the recovery is to get people to move back to cities and to plan for cities to grow. It also is beginning to look like that there are certain structural shifts in the way people consume things uh, that are likely to be more pronounced, if not permanent. And I'm thinking of things like delivery services uh, and online retail. Uh, those things could potentially be much environmentally worse uh, than the current way of doing things, particularly in a place like San Francisco that is set up to support sustainable transportation, as Tom was saying, for most of the retail neighborhood trips. If the small businesses aren't there and if people are buying from Amazon and there's a supply chain that's different there, uh, that could be uh, an environmental negative. It doesn't have to be, uh, but that's something that we need to look at. Uh, and I think the third thing is, uh, particularly with the new administration, the opportunity for more federal stimulus and to finally start getting serious about infrastructure uh, will be both an economic benefit, something the country has needed to do for a very long time. And when you start thinking about long-term investments as a government, you can't not think about climate. Uh, and particularly, I think, a, an administration that gets it about infrastructure is going to get it about climate. And so, so that, that's going to be leading to green infrastructure, which we're badly going to need for the long term. Great. Thank you, Ted. You know, one thing that Ted mentioned in his response to his first question was the inequities about the types of people that have lost their jobs. Um, and with many crises, we see our impacts of communities of color and other vulnerable populations hit first and worse. We know that air pollution, severe weather, and economic upheaval brought on by climate change is no different. Um, and additionally, you know, people most at risk for a shuttered economy are the same people who are going to be vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And at the end of the day, um, you know, the health department is really responsible for the health impacts of our residents. Navina, um, I was wondering if you can introduce yourself and discuss some of the health impacts of climate change that you have seen, both as a physician and your role at the health department, and some of the things that the health department is doing to address climate change. Sure. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so my name is Navina Baba. I am a physician by training um, and actually trained in allergy and immunology. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm a deputy director here at the Department of Public Health. But, um, you know, with my uh, background, I um, 
when you, and I trained in a safety net system. So was absolutely actually seeing um, effects of climate change um, since my training and onwards. And part of this has to do with the fact that um, in the in the healthcare system, when you when you talk to a patient, you kind of try to understand um, a little bit about their disease and some of the risk factors they have. And so, for our asthma and allergy patients, it was always um, you know what what is in your environment, but very um, specific to you know do you have pets at home? Um, does anybody smoke at home? Um, very kind of personalized touches, um, and then. Um, you, we definitely saw, and I think um, I trained in Los Angeles, you definitely saw the impacts of um, people living near freeways, the built environment, um, and the effects that we didn't necessarily capture in the healthcare system. Um, and so um, I, taking a step back, and this is what really pivoted me to public health was, um, and I'm sure a, a number of people know this, is that um, your zip code actually really um, talks a lot more about your health than any of the stuff that we ask about. So, um, you know, family history is important. I'm not going to discount that. Um, and, um, you know, what you've been exposed to um, in your personal environment is important. But the zip code um, it is probably one of the strongest predictors of, of if you're going to develop disease. Um, and so that really led me to this, this public health world of how can we think um, in a big system level, um, how do we change that? Because um, zip codes and um, being able to, um, you know, breathe clean air just feels like a fundamental inequity. Um, the fact that you might have to live in a, a zip code that puts you at exposure um, for a high, higher disease prevalence. And so when I joined the Department of Public Health, I actually joined um, during a pandemic as well, the H1N1 pandemic, um, which was an emergency. Um, and um, what quickly um, became you know, apparent with my work in the department uh, was that climate change was actually having major impacts on our emergency response. And so San Francisco, while I was, um, while I was here in the department in my role as emergency and emergency um, response, experienced a number of heat waves and experienced a number of wildfires. Um, and I think that really woke us up to the impacts of climate change. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to live by, um, you know, the ocean to ensure that we had um, good access to, to good air um, or that, you know, San Francisco has always had a mild climate and would not experience 105 degree weather. Um, so on a population level, seeing that disruption and then also seeing where that, that disruption impacted um, people the most. Um, and it is definitely in the communities that have had long-standing health inequities. Um, and that is, again, because of zip code, because of poor access to not only health care, but to food, um, to economic opportunities, um, to the built environment, um, all of that coming together in a, during, in a disaster um, setting really just um, amplifies all of the inequities that we saw. And so when we saw who was getting hospitalized, who was having um, poor um, or um, bad impacts from these disasters, it was definitely um, our communities that have traditionally had um, poor health outcomes because of the inequities that we saw in society. Um, and so the department, um, really what we've looked at is how do we make our, our communities more resilient? Because one of the fundamental things that we've learned is that um, answers don't come from government. They come from the people that live in the community. They know their environment the best. They know what they need. And really developing these community partnerships to say, you know, we know that climate change is coming. We know that these are the impacts that everybody's felt. How do we work with you all to determine the best solutions um, for the community that is most impacted? Um, and we've seen some really wonderful partnerships come out of that. Uh, where a community has been very innovative in thinking through how are we going to help our seniors? How are we going to help our children? How are we going to help the people that have chronic diseases get through these different, um, you know, uh, disasters um, due to climate change, like wildfires, um, poor air quality days, and um, heat? Thanks, Navita. Um, we're running a little low on time, but I'd be remiss if I did not ask you this question. And I know I have one more question that I really want to ask the panelists. Um, I know you've been really engaged in the COVID-19 response. Um, and what lessons do you think we have learned from COVID that can be applied to climate change? I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen very um, starkly in COVID is again, the disproportionate impact. So um, in San Francisco, you know, um, and this data is public, 
50% of our cases are almost 50% of our cases is, are in our Latino community and they make up 15% of the population. And again, so the disproportionate um, impacts in our immigrant um, community are our fr frontline workers um, that may not be able to access um, sick leave, um, that have to work for income. Um, all of those inequities get um, shown very clearly anytime there's a pandemic. And so um, I think some of the lessons learned again is um, when these issues have come up, it is really the communities that have the solutions um, and really listening to that community voice to, to work with them to see how can we make a better impact um, when, through our work in the Department of Public Health and through city government. Um, and I have to say, again, even in COVID, some of our most innovative models of getting testing access, getting um, the right to recover, have come from that community voice. Great. Thanks, Navina. And thank you so much for your work and your leadership in uh, getting us through this pandemic. We all really appreciate it. So I have one question, and I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to keep their response to one sentence, which I know this is going to be really tough, but I we've talked so much about the relationship between race and climate change, and it's something that's often ignored. And the mayor talked earlier about, you know, the recent protests for racial justice and last week's insurrection and, you know, police reform, call attention to the fact that racism is still deeply embedded into our institutions and public policies. Uh, one of the goals for San Francisco's climate action plan is to address racial equity. And I'd like to ask each of you from your perspective, you know, what does equitable climate change in San Francisco look like? Debbie, let's start with you. One sentence. Um, right. Equitable climate change means that when we make choices, we keep the workforce in mind to have a just transition so everyone, all boats rise and everyone's voice is at the table. So we're doing what really matters in a way that works for the people we're trying to help. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Tom? I would say that because transportation historically has had such disparate impacts on communities of color, uh, invest the scarce resources we have, whether it's bringing back community service faster or investing in making streets safer for walking and biking or electrification in the specific communities who have suffered the disbenefits and impacts of transportation historically. Great. Ted? I think it would be just recognize that environmental policies in pursuit of the goal create winners and losers and make sure the winners and loser don't or aren't race don't have big racially disparate impacts. And if they are, uh, create some compensor, compensatory system to offset the uh, communities that are most adversely affected by it. Thanks, Ted. And Navina, we'll end with you. I think um, really starting with the communities that we know will um, have the most, um, will be impacted the most by climate change and, and these issues, to start with them in this conversation. Um, oftentimes those communities are, you know, some of the last people that are brought into these conversations. So always knowing that they are going to be disproportionately impacted and they need the first seat at the table um, when we come to these discussions. Thank you. Um, now we'd like to take a couple questions from the audience. So Rich, do you have a couple questions ready for our panelists? One for Ted, if you could, I think it's more of a clarification question. Did you say that 70,000 people moved out of San Francisco or can you just uh, clarify what you said there? Yeah, the not 70,000 moved out, 70,000 more moved out than moved in. And we know this from looking at change of address request to the US Postal Service in the, since the pandemic started. Thanks. Um, and then I have one for Tom. Um, do you have any thoughts with the new Biden administration coming in, um, how there might be opportunities to, to leverage that to help make our um, transit service more convenient, safe, affordable, and equitable? Uh, yes, specifically, we're working right now to, uh, to identify projects that would improve community safety and reliability uh, to get them shovel ready for what, what we hope will be a, a, a pretty a, a pretty big investment in infrastructure stimulus. We want to be ready to take advantage of that and uh, show that we can use public dollars wisely and and and, and make them make people's commutes and, and, and travel safer. Thank you, Tom. And then uh, one for Navina. Um, 
can you share anything or say anything about any work that uh, DPH might be doing to sort of study and document the positive impacts from access to nature? Sure. Um, there's been a lot about greening and how that can really change the environment. Um, and so um, we do have a, a website on the climate and health and um, some of those impacts have been cataloged there if people want to go. Uh, I just want to thank all of our panelists for their great insights on the major challenges around climate change. Um, and why it's clear we have a responsibility to our future, it is very clear that we also have a social, economic, health, and racial imperative to our communities right now. Um, so we are going to give a very brief presentation on um, the background of our climate action plan and how you can get involved. We might go a couple minutes over 6.30, but we'll try to have um, this webinar conclude so everyone could uh, have their dinner. So thank you panelists. I really appreciate everyone being here. So, so next I'm gonna talk about um, why the city needs a climate action plan, our framework for this plan, and how you can get involved to shape our plan. So let's jump right in. Next slide. So for the last several years, we have seen parts of California destroyed by climate fires and engulfed cities um, in smoke, making climate change no longer just an abstract reality, but unfortunately a reality that has impacted everyone. And really to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need a plan. Um, the last time the San Francisco did a climate action plan was 2013. And we really need a roadmap, which will detail a framework for measuring, planning, and reducing greenhouse gases, and a plan that has goals, strategies, and actions. Next slide. So earlier we heard that San Francisco is going to be a net zero emission by 2050. Um, so what does that really mean? So between 2021 now and 2050, we need to eliminate almost all of our emissions from fossil fuels, um, which means we'll need to reduce emissions by 68% by 2030, and that will set us on a path to be net zero emissions by 2050. And these emission targets support the scientific consensus of what cities are being asked to do around the world to help keep global temperature increases below 1.5 degrees. And this aligns with the Paris Agreement. In our plan, it's also critical that we address racial equity, health, resilience, and the economy, and ensure that everyone is protected from the impacts of climate change. Next slide. So our climate action plan will paint a picture of what we need to do to meet our net zero emission goals. And we will be looking for feedback on strategies across six sectors, um, which I mentioned earlier in our panel discussion. Again, these sectors are energy supply, transportation and land use, housing, building operations, responsible production and consumption and healthy ecosystems. And we have goals that help us achieve uh, our zero emission city in each of these sectors. In our upcoming workshops, we will dive deeper into these sectors and explain um, what the strategies are and the goals that we need your input on. We will also have fact sheets on our website with all of this information. Next slide. So whatever climate strategies we put in place in the coming months and years ahead, they not only need to address climate change, but they must address systemic racism, the inequities in health, the economy, and ensure a resilient community. We want to make sure our climate solutions also have a lens towards racial and social equity, just transition and economy, and resilience. So for all of our climate actions, we're going to make sure we evaluate them through these four lenses on the slide. So to drive climate action, we really need to harness our communities. We need to create a new paradigm around solving climate change, placing people in the middle. So next, I'm going to talk about how you can get involved. So here are the engagement methods I'm going to discuss. Um, and unfortunately, we've had to completely adapt our process to be virtual because of COVID-19. Um, and we're definitely going to miss our in-person conversations and meeting with the community. But hopefully, we've designed strategies where we can really get true community engagement. Next slide. 
So although we can't have these face-to-face -face conversations, stakeholder engagement is still key to making this plan a success. The city is seeking community input on draft strategies and actions, which is a body of work that represents over a year and a half of dedication from city agencies, technical work groups, and many stakeholders. I would like to thank all of the stakeholders that have been involved to this point, which is about 100 different stakeholder organizations, but we still need more engagement to make sure our initiative is grounded in the aspirations and desires of the community. And in order to kick off this effort, we have convened a community climate council of diverse organizations to guide us on our outreach strategies. Those organizations are shown on this slide. And we hope each of you will become a stakeholder in this process. Next slide. So next week, we'll be launching our interactive workshop series, which are open to the public. And we hope each of you can attend. Many of these workshops will have a guest speaker, um, we'll have a comprehensive presentation on our climate action plan. And the second half of these workshops will be dedicated to getting your feedback. Um, next week, we'll have our first workshops. On Wednesday, we'll be co-hosting a workshop with SPUR. And on Thursday evening, we'll have our um, first guest speaker, which will have Kate Gordon from the governor's office. Um, the subsequent workshops will focus on the lenses that I just spoke about. And we will also have two in-language workshops, one in Spanish and the other in Chinese. Um, if you're unable to make these workshops, please con contact us and we'll try to accommodate as many requests for other presentations as possible. Next slide. And while we can't have in-person open house events, we have created an online open house platform. So you can access our online open house platform through our website. This platform will allow you to see our proposed strategies and actions and provide feedback and also let us know your ideas. So we definitely encourage everyone to explore the open house platform, learn about our ideas and share yours. So on our uh, open house platform, uh, there will be an option to take a survey where you can enter a raffle to win $100. But we know that not everyone is dialed into the digital world. So we'll be uh, distributing postcards through our library and other community-based organizations. And we also are going to set up a climate hotline where residents can leave feedback and myself and my staff will dedicate time to calling residents back every week. So lastly, this slide shows our proposed timeline, which of course is subject to change, but we're hoping to finalize our climate action plan in about six months. But our plan will not be finalized until all of our engagement is complete and all of the feedback we get from you is addressed. So um, in closing, I encourage everyone to get involved and we're looking forward to your thoughts and ideas. Our ultimate goal is to be a net zero emission city by 2050, but how we get there and how we make sure everyone reaps the benefits is just as important. And we need your help making San Francisco's climate action plan one that tackles economic recovery, supports resilient, healthy, and equitable communities. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, please reach out if you have any questions and I hope you have a great evening.